Out of all of the high performance cars that I've talked about here on the channel in Beards and Cars, which incidentally you can click on the playlist and check out all of those, Maseratis, Porsches, Astons, etc. Out of all of those though, there's one vehicle which by far and away I get the most questions about and even have random conversations with complete strangers, and I'll tell you about one of those in a second, and that is my Touareg V10. So I thought, you know what, I've done a day one review for that car, I've done a long term test review, I've even done videos on how quick it is from 0 to 60 and fitting custom car mats to it, and incidentally you can find links to all of those down below if you want to watch them. But for this video, I wanted to actually sum up everything you need to know about potential Touareg V10 ownership, especially from a long term point of view. And I've narrowed it down to 10 things. The 5 best things and the 5 worst things you could say about Touareg V10 ownership. Now I'm going to talk about the positives first and then get to the negatives. So let's start first of all with my first positive. This one is actually a two-fold positive, which is kind of a two-in-one in effect, and that is that the car has this interesting position on the market wherein it's both a sleeper, but it's also a great conversation starter. And it all depends on where you are and who's looking at the car. See, the sleeper factor, for those who don't know what a sleeper is, is essentially a vehicle which is a lot quicker and a lot better than it looks. It's an understated car that's actually really fast or really good. Generally, though, it falls under performance. The Touareg V10 is just that. To the uninitiated, to those who don't know what a V10 Touareg is, it just looks like a big blue SUV. Maybe a slightly older one, although it does look pretty good for its age, so it certainly doesn't look old in that sense. Most people tend to think it's a good looking 4x4, but they don't really know anything about it or why it's special, even though it has V10 TDI written on the back. At the same time though, people who do know what it is love to talk about it, and they always ask me, you know, what is that V10 actually like to drive? What's it like to own one? What's the fuel economy like? Is it quick? What does it feel like by today's standards? And to give you a perfect prime example, only a couple of weeks ago, a complete stranger knocked on my door just because they'd seen the Touareg V10 on the driveway and wanted to ask me what it was like to own one because he was driving to view a Touareg R50 that same day with the intent of potentially buying it. So it's literally a fantastic conversation starter, even with complete strangers, but at the same time, to anyone who's not into cars and you could say even more so into unicorn cars, as the Touareg is, being rarer and rarer, it's a great sleeper and a conversation starter. The second great point is another combo, and that is two things which are inherently linked. Those are the levels of comfort and the levels of space, and that covers everything from the suspension setup to the interior space to the loading space. Now, the suspension on this car is fantastic. It broke day one, though, and that ties into some of the issues which you can potentially have, but we'll talk about that in just a second. Now, it has an air suspension system. You can adjust it inside the cabin to make it higher or lower, all the way up to cross-track mode, which feels like a monster truck. It's supremely comfortable, and it's self-leveling, at least to the degree that it can be. So when you park it on a driveway, it will, for instance, raise the back end and lower the front to make the car as straight as possible. And the other day I parked it on a high curb and the car was completely flat. It wasn't tipped to the side at all because the left two wheels raised suspension height so that the body remained exactly level. It's a clever system. It works very well for a 2006 car and it certainly adds to the comfort factor. Of course, being almost three tons, you've got to have good suspension. The second thing though is about that space, which of course is inherently tied into that. Now I've talked about the comfort and the space of the Touareg before, but it really is one of the best things about it because Touaregs have gotten bigger over time. SUVs in general have gotten massive since 2006 with seven seaters, extended bodies. Just look at the Audi Q7 and beyond. And by today's standards, the Touareg actually isn't all that huge. It's a big car for sure, in fact it's as wide as I am tall, but it's not obscenely large, especially in terms of length. Being a five-seater, and I believe you can get optional boot-fitted seats to make it have more, although to me that doesn't really matter, it's actually very modest in terms of length. It's relatively wide, relatively tall, but not overly long, and that's one of the reasons why it's so good off-road as well. In terms of rear space, 
it's fantastic. You can fold the back seats completely flat, as you'd hope, and without getting too explicit for YouTube, let's just say that I've found it perfect for anything from nocturnal activities to carrying about 20 pieces of full-size H-shaped scaffolding bar and everything in between. It really does have TARDIS levels of space. The third good point is actually an interesting one because it ties into both the five positives and the five negatives. So I'm gonna return to this point under that later five in the video as well, but that is economy. Now, you can kind of understand why that would be both a good and a bad point potentially, but the reason why, first of all, I think the economy on this SUV is really good is because consider what it's working with. This is a 5-litre V10 twin-turbo over 300 horsepower SUV, which weighs 2.7 metric tons. It's literally one of the heaviest SUVs on the road, heavier than a Range Rover, far heavier than a Bentley Continental GT. It's one of the heaviest cars you can buy. In fact, it's only a couple of hundred kilos lighter than a Hummer H2. It's massive in terms of weight, but interestingly, not in terms of size. Now, with all of that being said, plus with that GPS verified 0-60 to that I talked about, in the case of mine, it's 6.9 seconds. For a three-ton SUV, to do 0 to 60 and 6.9 on 14 year old technology at this point, but at the same time to be able to average between 28 and about 30 miles per gallon, that's pretty incredible. For a normal SUV to do that would be rare, and a lot of even Tuareg owners, usually non V10 owners, I will add tend to say, well, you're exaggerating that. There's no way you're getting 28 to the gallon out of a Tuareg V10. Well, yes I am, because I've verified it with receipts and multiple journeys. I use it literally as a daily driver, and yes I do. I average between 28 and 30 to the gallon. On the highway exclusively, it can even get up around 36. Although, of course, you're never exclusively on the highway, so it doesn't stay that high. At this point, you're probably wondering, well, how could that possibly be a downside? Well, stay with me. I'm going to revisit that point on the top five worst things. Next up we have one of the things which I actually love the most about this Tuareg, and this is something which probably a lot of owners even might disagree with me on. And I would hazard a guess that a lot of those owners have probably not driven that many other cars. In fact, for a lot of those people, the Tuareg V10 is probably one of the most exotic cars they've owned. In my position, which is a very fortunate one, not only do I drive that, but I've driven a lot of high-performance cars, many of which are significantly more expensive and significantly faster than the Tuareg. Astons, Porsches, Maseratis, even the Maserati that I owned myself. So I have, let's just say, a pretty good frame of reference for what a good performance car is. And that leads me directly into this fourth of five great points. It's another dual one, because it's about the steering and the brakes. The steering and the brakes on the Tuareg V10 are excellent. Now, admittedly, I completely changed all of the discs and pads on my Tuareg at its last service about, I think, six or 7,000 miles ago. So the brakes are, of course, gonna be in good condition. But again, I've driven brand new cars off the lot from dealerships that have had less responsive brakes than mine. The discs alone on the Tuareg are borderline Ferrari F50 sized. They are huge, and you would hope so for a nearly three ton SUV. The brakes are powerful, there's a huge amount of feedback, which is fantastic. And for those who don't know what I'm talking about, brake feedback or brake feel, as it's commonly called, is basically how effective the brakes feel to you as the driver through the pedal. So, in other words, you could have a car that has fantastic brakes and this is something which Mercedes has often been criticized for, and I've experienced this in person actually, where they have really powerful brakes, but they don't feel that powerful. So it doesn't feel like the car's slowing down quick enough. In fact, even something as expensive as the SLR McLaren was accused of just that problem. It didn't have enough feel through the brakes. The Touareg does. It has extremely powerful brakes, and they work very, very well. The reason why I'm including the steering and you'll notice I said steering and not handling very specifically into this point is because they are inherently tied. You can't have a good performance car through corners without a combination of good steering and brakes. This has both. Now, one of the best things about the Tuareg V10, easily one of the best on a daily basis, is something which very few people actually talk about, and that is the steering range. See, because you're sitting so high, the angle of the steering, despite having a perfectly set up steering column where it's not like driving a bus, it's, you know, a proper steering wheel like a sports car would have, 
it has this incredible turning circle wherein you can literally turn a Tuareg in basically two lanes of traffic to make a complete U-turn. That makes me remember, for instance, my time in my Quattroporte. Once I had to get around a small painted roundabout on the road in my Quattroporte and it literally involved a three-point turn just to get around this tiny roundabout. In the Tuareg, that's never a problem. It's such a remarkably capable car in terms of its steering angle that it really can turn through incredibly tight corners. In fact, it shares that in common with a London taxi. They're also very well known for having incredibly good steering angles, which are much tighter than you'd ever think that vehicle could do. And for something like a Touareg, which is tall, wide, and extremely heavy with all-wheel drive and big fat tires, well, you need it to have as much maneuverability as possible for stuff like parking lots, multi-story car parks, for instance, or even just tight British lanes, and it does. It's fantastic in that regard. And the last of my five positives is definitely one which a lot of people will know about, but not that many people will truly understand why this is such a good thing. And that is the talk. You can't talk, pun not intended, about a Touareg V10 without talking about that V10 engine. Yet so far in this review, you'll notice I haven't really talked about the engine at all, apart from maybe fuel economy. There's a reason for that. The V10 engine is great, but a lot of it actually goes beyond that to be just an impressive car in general. That torque, though, is easily the single best thing about the engine, and it ties into two of the other points that I made. In fact, technically three. The engine makes it a great talking point, which is the first thing that I mentioned. Of course, its design helps with the economy, which is another thing that I mentioned, and it also, of course, gives you great performance. What I haven't talked about, though, is the reason why. Why the Tuareg is so quick off the line, and why the economy is so good, and it's all down to a little thing called torque. Now, torque is thrown around a lot by petrol heads, and you get the distinct impression that a lot of those people don't actually have a clue what torque really is. They just throw out torque numbers and horsepower and the size of the engine and how many turbos the air conditioning has. No, torque is very simple. It's just twisting power. The reason why torque is so good is because horsepower in daily driving is completely irrelevant. Horsepower gives you performance. Torque gives you economy. Torque is how inherently strong the engine's pulling power is, and also, crucially, how lazy the engine can be. That's why something like a, a big supercharged Jag will have a lot of torque and be effortless to drive. The Touareg is the same. In fact, this Touareg V10, even in its initial form, has more torque than a Dodge Viper. Mine has even more torque because it's got a performance tuning box, I believe close to 600 pound feet, which is whatever ridiculous number in Newton meters, something like 750 or 800, I believe. That level of torque, of course, gives you great pulling power, but my Tuareg has never towed anything in its life. So why do you need all that torque? Well, for two reasons. One, as I said, torque allows you to have incredible launch off the line because it just hooks up that torque, that twisting power straight to the wheels. It means you don't need to rev the engine high. You just get immediate performance in a very similar way to an electric car in a more abstract sense. The second huge advantage of torque, though, is something which a lot of people have no idea about. You see, if an engine has a huge amount of torque, it means it doesn't need to rev that high to get enough torque to move because the entire purpose of a gearbox is to be literally a torque multiplier. And the reason why cars have so many gears is to give it prime amounts of torque at any given moment to maximize economy and reduce the amount of effort that the engine has to put in. That's literally the entire purpose of a gearbox in a daily driver. In the Touareg, it has so much torque that it feels like it barely even needs gears at all. And that improves economy. As counterintuitive as it sounds to have Viper levels of pulling power, that gives the car its economy. Because this thing on the highway sits at 65, 70 miles an hour, barely turning at 1500 RPM. That's, you know, close to what most cars would need just to pull away. And the engine running so slowly, well, by definition means that you have less power strokes, less induction strokes, less fuel, put simply, is being squirted into the engine, and because you're using less, it's better for economy. It really is that simple. But that brings me to the end of my five positives. What now about the negatives? Well, I'll be honest with you. The first negative that I'm gonna talk about is the entire reason why I wanted to make this video, because it was one of the few things about the Tuareg which I don't really like. So let's get into it. The gearbox. Now, I just mentioned that this car feels like it almost doesn't even need a gearbox, and that's absolutely true. 
Sometimes though, that's the problem. So when you're cruising around, the gearbox works just fine. It does have a Tiptronic option where you can manually select what gear you want to be in, and some of them even had flappy paddles as well. The problem comes when you're not in sport mode, which for me is most of the time, I have no need to be. It's not as good for economy and it's more for performance, which I'm not using most of the time. So if you put the car into drive and then just potter around town, well, the problem comes in when you need to overtake someone because you floor it and it takes a good second before the car actually knocks it down a gear and gets its arse in gear in effect. That's kind of a problem because it means it feels sluggish and for a car with over 550 pound feet of torque and over 300 horsepower stock, it should not feel that sluggish. Now, once you actually get going, especially if you launch it off the line, it doesn't have that lag. In fact, it's incredibly quick. It's when you're already moving in traffic and then you pull out to overtake, you in effect need to floor it before you pull out. It's not an earth shattering issue, it's just the primary way which I believe the car shows its age. The gearbox technology, although in my case, has been supremely reliable, I've never had any issues with it at all, it does mean that the car feels a little sluggish compared to what the raw potential of that engine is. The second issue is more of one which could come up or might not. In my case, I've been fortunate to never have this issue, but it is repairs. Now, one of the key things that puts many people off buying a Touareg is they're notorious for reliability, for repair costs, for these quote unquote engine out jobs, and those are technically correct. That's the issue though. If you have one that breaks, of course it's gonna be awkward. Mine has never broken. In fact, I've talked before on the channel about the times when something has gone wrong and the majority of them haven't really been the car's fault. Certainly no fault of the V10. When the air suspension broke, that's got nothing to do with the V10 engine. Any car with air suspension could have that issue. And that one time that the car wouldn't start, it was because some moron mechanic hadn't tightened the battery terminal properly. That's also not a V10 engine issue. Apart from that, my Touareg has honestly started first time, every time, since I bought it. And that is pretty remarkable, especially for something which already had 100,000 miles on the clock when I bought it. The simple fact is though that if, if you do need to repair it, which is always a possibility, it is very awkward to work on the Touareg. And I don't just mean the engine. Most things are in awkward places. For instance, that aforementioned battery terminal was under the passenger seat. So to get to the battery in the car, one of two batteries incidentally, one is in the boot and one is under the passenger seat, you have to put the seat all the way forward, then move this thing, move the seat all the way back, tip it backwards, get the battery out, it's got its own holding thing. It's awkward. It's more awkward than a classic, for instance. I am, of course, mostly, though, referring to the engine. For instance, an alternator job on this car, which for most vehicles will be a fairly simple thing, bolt on, bolt off. In the case of this one, you have to remove a considerable amount of the top of the engine to actually be able to get to the alternator since it's at the back of the engine, in effect, behind the dashboard. So it's a borderline engine out job. Now, of course, that's if the alternator goes, and everything will break eventually, but it really is luck of the draw. I've had a fantastic one, so of course I would recommend it. Other people I'm sure have had issues, but I think a lot of those horror stories come from people who have never owned the car. However, the fact does remain that if something goes wrong with the engine, it is probably gonna be awkward to work on. Some things you can do yourself, there are even videos on YouTube of how to do that alternator yourself without taking the engine out, so it can be done, but certain things are certainly more awkward than a traditional car would be. But again, that's the price you pay for a high performance unicorn. The next thing, unfortunately, is something you can't get away from, and it's probably gonna be more of an issue in coming years as we move towards those electric car only new sales standards and all that kind of environmental stuff and that is the tax now the tax will vary a lot depending on the country you're in but here in the uk i'm currently paying about 580 pounds a year to road tax this car that's a hell of a lot of money but at the same time that's actually about the same as like a 2007 jag xk so if you put it that way it doesn't really make that much sense you'd think it was all about the emissions but the jaguar proves that that isn't the case compared that to my Maserati, for instance, the Quattroporte was 340 pounds a year to tax. 
It's crazy. I mean, that makes no sense between the three examples that I just mentioned. Regardless of all that, though, it is a fact that the tax is expensive. And of course, you could do it on a six-month basis or pay it monthly with direct debit. That's all down to you. It's just something that you need to know. It is the biggest ongoing thing that you're going to be paying out for, apart from, of course, fuel. Now, speaking of fuel, I mentioned I was going to come back to that as both a positive and a negative. So why am I talking about it as both? Everything I said earlier on is exactly true. I do get 28 to the gallon average, 30 to the gallon sometimes, and even higher on the highway. And it is a fantastic engine for having great economy because of its massive diesel torque and low revs. That's all 100% true. The issue is, though, you have to drive it sensibly to get anywhere near that kind of economy. And a lot of people who buy a Touareg V10 don't buy it to drive sensibly. In fact, a lot of people would probably say, well, what's the point of buying it at all if you're not going to use that performance? Well, for me, that's actually always been the case. I don't need to do 200 miles an hour everywhere to enjoy a car. Knowing that the car can do that is actually a lot of the fun for me. But I digress, because I'm not talking about bragging rights. Either way, get back to the economy talk. That is that you have to drive it sensibly to get that kind of economy. If you do floor it, it drops like a stone. And if you drive it exclusively in a city, well then it's gonna drop a hell of a lot. You're looking at more like under 20 miles per gallon average rather than up around 28, 30. So it really does depend on where you live and crucially how you drive. If you drive it sensibly, you will get remarkable economy out of it. The problem is, contrary to me being a slightly younger driver and you'd assume I would floor it everywhere, I actually don't. I like to be fairly restrained in a lot of my cars, either ones that I own or ones that I don't. To me, that's not where my enjoyment comes from. It does mean, though, that I get really good fuel economy. A lot of owners don't, because they clearly don't drive it sensibly. Now, I'm going to freely admit that to find the fifth negative, I really had to scrape the bottom of the barrel, because I genuinely love the car, and a lot of these negatives don't even apply to me personally, such as the negative economy or repair costs. So I had to just kind of come up with something for this fifth one. And in effect, it ties into the second one that I already mentioned about repairs being awkward, and that is, of course, repair costs. However, this one has affected me in a more tangible way, and that is part costs. And when I say part costs, I'm talking about the things that even if it doesn't break, you are still going to have to repair. Stuff like tires, you could even count fuel in there as well if you wanted to. Stuff like in my case, for instance, I've lost a couple of the center Volkswagen wheel caps, which is just a small plastic part, which happens to cost £30 every time to replace it from eBay. The costs can be surprisingly high, even for small components. Now, the tires, of course, you'd assume are going to be fairly expensive. They're like 275 millimeter wide all round. So yeah, the high performance tyres, the ones that I use are General Grabber GTs, which is a very popular choice for the car. And on a side note, I strongly recommend them, they're really, really good. But they cost like £170 each, and that's for a good deal. So part costs is something that you need to be aware of. It's not necessarily about the reliability even. Certain things you just have to change over time because it's a consumable, such as the tyres. In my case, for instance, I replace the mirror glass on the passenger side. I've done various other smaller fixes to the car, such as the wheel caps that I mentioned. These smaller things are surprisingly expensive for what they are. So yes, you can buy the car itself for a great price, but some of the parts are not quite as thrifty. Another prime example being the roof spoiler. The Touareg, of course, sometimes came with a usually silver roof spoiler on the top of the car, which you could actually split in two and use as a roof rack. I love the look of that. I've actually been trying to find one for my Touareg. But they're very expensive. They're like sometimes £300 just for that thing, if you can even find one in the first place. So parts, as I said, can be very expensive. Overall, though, that's it for my five positives and five negatives. If you're new to the channel or new to my Touareg V10 content and want to know more, then definitely check out those other videos that I mentioned below. Fitting the custom floor mats and the 0-60 test, which was a lot of fun. My day one review, when I first bought the car and the air suspension broke. And of course, not that long ago, my first long-term test for the car as well. And of course, if you want to check out any of my other car reviews, including many of those that I mentioned, including my personal Maserati, then click right here on screen to check out that playlist. Until next time, though, I'll see you then. And for now, as always, thanks for watching.